Hello, and now our portrait of the filmmaker Satyajit Ray. Ever since Ray's first film, Pathapanchali, won a special award at Cannes in 1956, he's been hailed as India's greatest film director and one of the finest of all directors. He steadfastly refused to go to Hollywood, preferring to live and work in his native Bengal, a small province of India long associated with the arts. He likes to work with his own dedicated team of actors and technicians, and in his own language, Bengali, an especially pure and ancient dialect spoken now by a small percentage of India's population. And yet his films are widely accessible. He uses his skills to tell his stories simply and lovingly, and the depth of feeling in his characterization arouses a basic human sympathy. His latest film is The Chess Players, which received its world premiere at the London Film Festival recently, and we took that opportunity to talk to Ray. With The Chess Players, Ray is reaching out towards a bigger audience. For the first time, he uses an international star, Richard Attenborough, and dialogue partly in English, partly in Hindi, the majority Indian language. It's a historical film set in the 1850s about the growth of the British Empire in India and the conflict that resulted. We start the profile of Ray with a clip from that film where the British general has his first audience with the King of Oud. His soldiers. This is a documentary film shot on the set of The Chess Players. It was directed by Ray's son for Calcutta TV. Ray makes films like few other directors. He not only directs the actors, he also operates the camera, writes the script, composes the music, designs the sets, and even draws the posters. This means that Ray can work with a personal and direct control over his material, rather like a writer or a painter. Ray comes from a family with a strong artistic tradition. His grandfather was a musician and a painter, and the family printing house, U. Ray and Sons, was the most progressive and the largest in Bengal. His father wrote and illustrated nonsense verses for children, an Indian Edward Lear. Unfortunately, he died when Ray was very young, and the family business went into liquidation. Ray was left to be brought up by his mother, without much money, but she managed to save enough to make sure he had the best education, at the Presidency College, Calcutta, where the more liberal traditions of the English school system prevailed. We were exposed to both Western and Eastern culture at the same time. I mean, we read... I used to... I used to take boys on paper. <laughs> I used to read the comics and everything, so I grew up in that kind of atmosphere where both uh, Western sort of influences and the normal in indigenous influences worked. Later, Ray came under the influence of a friend of the family, the great Indian writer Tagore. He went to Tagore's International University, Santinakatan, where he studied art and calligraphy. This is some of his earliest work in the early... He then embarked on a career as a commercial artist for an English advertising agency in Calcutta, illustrating books and designing their covers. He was one of the finest book designers in India, but his real passion was films, and together with some friends, he founded the first Indian film club. Then, by chance, he heard that Jean Renoir was to visit Calcutta saw an advertisement in one of our dailies there, statesman, Mr. Jean Renoir, the French director, uh, would like to interview so-and-so so -and -so for a film he's made. I said, how extraordinary. And he was staying in a hotel which was right next door from the advertising agency, the Great Eastern. And I said, I, I must go and see him. So I just went, I just walked across to the hotel and, and presented myself as a, as a film buff. I mean, the word hadn't come into use at that time, but I said, I'm very interested in the cinema. I've seen your American films, but not your French films yet. He said he was a marvelous man. He said he had just come for, you know, just location hunting and interviewing some actors for the film. But, uh, well, I, I used to go and see him occasionally. 
You see, I already had, I had read the book on which uh, my first film was based, Pate Panciali. In fact, I had uh, illustrated a special edition of the book. And while doing it, uh, the thought struck me that, that it would make a, an interesting film. And I told Renoir, Renoir told me, why don't you make a film if you're so interested? Uh, why don't you give up what you're doing and go into filmmaking? I said, well, I have an idea to make this kind of a film, and I described the story. He said, uh, do it. It sounds marvelous. This was uh, on his first visit. Well, uh, I, at that point, of course, I couldn't think of giving up a very good job. It was a difficult decision to make. But at that point, I was sent to London to the head office of this advertising agency for higher training. And I spent six months here, most of the time, uh, looking at films, really, and losing more, <laughs> losing interest in advertising in the process. How many films do you think you saw in London? Oh, about a hundred. About a hundred. One of the first films he saw in London was De Sica's Bicycle Thieves, the first neorealist film from Italy. It was a revelation to him. He recognized in its rough documentary style the way he wanted to make Patha Panchali, and on the boat home, he wrote his script and decided to go ahead with the film. It really took two and a half years to make it, and I was shooting on weekends only, because I, I had my job all the way through, because part of the salary went into the film. Nobody would put up any money, and they said, you can't shoot film. Why uh, did they say that? Well, I said that you can't shoot on location. You have to be shooting in the studio. You have to have the lights under your control. I mean, the sun is very... Uh, undependable, and you can't shoot in the rainy season, and you can't do this, you can't do that, you Are can't we... work with amateurs, you can't... All sorts of, you know, don'ts and uh, can'ts and all sorts of that. Why did you take no notice of all this? Why did I take no notice? Well, I, you know, I didn't have that much of confidence. But then what I did was that I borrowed a 16 millimeter camera, and I, I took some footage myself under the worst possible light conditions, shooting early sort of before sunrise, after sunset, in pouring rain, and it all came out. And, of course, um, then I decided that I will make this film with amateurs. I'm an amateur myself. I'll have an amateur cameraman. Well, this young boy was about 21, 22. But we believed in certain things, a certain approach to photography, because I'd seen the Italian neorealist films. I'd seen the work of amateurs uh, in De Sica's films and in some other films. And uh, my great, one of my heroes was Cartier Bresson and available light and all that kind of thing. And my cameraman also had the same approach and the same attitude to photography as myself, using bounce lights and this and that. We'll, we said, we'll try experiments. We'll see what, how it comes out. I, I sat and thought about it for such a long time that I had the whole thing by heart. So I would l give little directions to my cameraman as to angles and things on bits of paper, sketches. In fact, that is a system which I developed later. What uh, my scripts consist of sketches and little notes uh, down the side, dialogue, camera movements and all that. They're never sort of mimeographed stuff which one can distribute to people. I mean, the dialogue is distributed. is a sequel to Patha Panchali and follows the boy Apu as he grows up. He leaves his mother for the big city, and left alone, she pines away. Yes, um, this was again a, a f scene of loneliness, extreme loneliness. Um, the mother, I, of course, in the process of making the film and writing the script, I developed a tremendous sympathy for the mother. And uh, what a now, let's try to recap, recall what happens in that film. She's left alone, the son is away in studying in Calcutta, she's ill, the son doesn't write to her as often as he should, and um, there's a train which passes near the house in the village, and she, uh, it's become a sort of symbol to her of the, of her son being away, being away in the city, and she sits outside 
outside the house below a tree, waiting for the train to pass, hoping that the train would bring her, bring her son back. But he never comes. And uh, then, of course, he, she feels the approach of death. And she begins to have hallucinations. She imagines, imagines that she's hearing the voice of a son calling. She staggers to the door, looks out, and there's fireflies. She can see the fireflies. That's the last image, I think, after that. One thing I believe in is that a mood, a certain mood, can be enhanced by certain states of nature, which again dictate certain qualities of lighting. For instance, the, the entire second part, the, the, the latter part of Patrick Machali was shot in the rainy season in very bleak kind of weather, sort of never, a, uh, never any sunlight at all. It was shot in the height, the height of monsoon. And that uh, dicta certainly dictated a certain kind of light, which was very gray. And uh, it also put us in a particular kind of mood Certainly, they put the actors in a kind of mood. Arrive on location, they find everything dark and grey and bleak, and it affects you. I think it affected the unit, it affected the actors, and it helped their acting, the performance, because they felt a kind of they were unified with the natural setting, with the with the mood of lighting, etc. And also in uh, in Aparajito, I think the latter part of the film were all shot on cloudy days with no sunlight at all, very grey, monochromatic, very grey. You have a great interest in music, and I believe you often yeah. compose the music for your own films. Oh, well, nowadays I do. Ever since, um, which one was it? Two Daughters. Ever since 60, 61, I've been using. What's the advantage in that? Is that because you get exactly what you want? Yes, certainly. But you see, before that I worked with professionals like Ravi Shankar and, um, and two other virtuosos, Ali Akbar. And, uh, but they are not film composers, really. They are, a brilliant, they are brilliant virtuosos, and I wanted to use their particular playing of sitar or whatever instrument they may be playing. But they, it's difficult to tie them down to certain uh, systems, certain methods, and they are not used to that. Such as? Which methods are you talking about? Well, you see, you, you describe a scene to them and uh, you give them a certain length of time, like a minute and a half. And in any case, they don't like to be dictated too much. And they were all good friends on a personal level, so I didn't want to jeopardize the friendship. So I finally decided to, since I couldn't find another composer to do the kind of thing that I wanted, I decided to teach myself. And you also began to operate the camera. Yes, again, you see, we're the professional cameraman. What happens? It used to happen with Mitra, my cameraman. You see, he would often ask for a second take or a third take, but never give me a specific reason for the second take. I would ask him, why do you want another take? I'm perfectly willing to take another. I go for another take, but tell me why you want it. He said, no, he would hem and haw, and then sort of, he said, well, I just, but then you can't afford uh, this sort of thing when you're working on a three-to-one ratio. So I had to, I had eventually to do the operating myself because occasionally even a little wobbly pen won't matter if the acting is really very strong. On occasion, of course, you have to have a perfect pen or a perfect track or perfect this, perfect that. But if you have a very strong performance in a certain kind of scene where you feel that the audience won't mind a little jerk here or there. That's why I decided to operate myself for the sake of economy. Charolata, an elegant realization of a poignant love story by Tagore, was the first film in which Ray operated the camera himself. <laughs>
Ray went on to make several films about modern India. Days and Nights in the Forest, The Adversary, Company Limited, and most recently, The Middleman. Films that deal with the pressures of urban life in contemporary Calcutta with its moral and political dilemmas. In 1972, however, Ray took another look into the past in Distant Thunder. It's set in 1943, but nonetheless, it's concerned to make a political point. I wanted to make a film of that for a long time, but, uh, you know, that things... It was only uh, in 70, 72 that I felt the time was right for that kind of film. And obviously, there was, uh, this was a man-made famine, and it certainly makes a very, very important point about... Uh, political point, let us put it that way because it was the time of the war, the Second World War, and the food was, was being diverted to the troops. And it was not as if there was a famine or anything like that. The, I mean, there was, a, there was a good harvest, but the people didn't have enough to eat in, in the villages. They eventually sort of streamed into the city. They came to the city of Calcutta. Actually, I had lived through that period. That was the time I was, uh, I, 43 was the year I got my advertising job. And I, we could see the villagers had, uh, who came to the city, famished people who were just dying in the streets. Right in front of our house there were dead bodies. Every morning there was a dead body. And we had to step over the body right outside the gate of the house. So that was, uh, that was there in my mind, that, 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 that spectacle of people dying of hunger in the streets of the city, while the actual famine was taking place in the villages itself. And, uh, but I didn't, uh, I wanted a period, uh, a distance uh, from that particular event. So, uh, although the, I had read the story when I read Patip Machali, and I felt that this also would make a good film, I didn't really, I w didn't want to do it then, at that point. It was much later that I went back to the book and decided that the time had come to make that film. And now a change in direction. Ray's latest film, The Chess Players, once more is set in the past, but it's made on a lavish scale with an international star and clearly aimed at a bigger market. It sets out to explore a critical time in India's history when the British marched in to annex the last independent kingdom. The original story is about the two, two chess-playing friends. The annexation is there in the background and the author uses the, the fact of uh, the takeover as a kind of contrast to these two chaps uh, obsessed with chess and uh, uninvolved in the political situation. But I decided to use the, the political situation as one half of the film and the two to run parallel, and the link to emerge towards the end, where you realize that this, after all, is a story of non-involvement, in a way, because they, again, using chess as a metaphor. So I wanted uh, this contrast between the grimness of the political situation and the light-heartedness heartedness of the, the original story, the story of the chess players. This total control of the process of the film, the script, the set, the operating the camera, um, obviously casting the actors, acting yeah. through with them what you do, uh, composing the music yourself, this is very, very rare in films. What strength do you think it gives you? Well, I can take, uh, well, I can call my films my own without any qualms. I mean, uh, generally, if there's a brilliant cameraman doing brilliant work without guidance from the director he should be given credit for what he does but it has it is not usually done uh, in films or well I can I I mean whatever is good or whatever is bad in my films is due to me I mean praise or blame it I, I feel much happier that way Sarajan Ray and we hear that you should be able to see the chess players in London soon and unlike the rest of Sarajat Ray's films, all over Britain after that. Meanwhile, Ray himself is completing yet another film back in Bengal. Next week, the first long television interview with the conductor Herbert von Karajan. And for the first time ever, 
He's let a television program into his private life and into his rehearsals, into his recordings, and he's talked freely about his music and his style of life. Herbert von Karajan, sometimes called the Emperor of Music, filmed in Salzburg, in Berlin, and in his three homes next week on the South Bank Show. Good night.